So Karima, let's go to the next question. Okay. So the next question is about the differences between uh, um, Morocco and um, and Europe. So can you tell me why you decided to move to Europe? Because uh, um, because there might be different reasons. So maybe you can just say what is your perspective? What uh, what are the the main reasons? What are the motivations for you to move to Europe? Yeah, there's definitely personal reasons and professional reasons. So for the per professional reasons, it's obviously because I am interested in the international exposure, and because um, I want to work in an international environment and be part of uh, an international team taking on projects. So uh, it's one of the reasons. And uh, and of course, there is a lot of opportunities in Europe. So I feel like that would open the door for me for many other opportunities. Um, I'm obviously interested in having some sort of a global experience. I'm not really uh, just um, I'm not focused or attached just to Europe. It could be in Eng any other English speaking country or in Asia. I'm really open. I'm in my 20s. What better age to explore the world than in my 20s? Um, yeah, and for personal reasons, it would be the nature. I'm one of my passions. Uh, my interest is hiking and Central Europe is very much known for the Austrian Alps, especially Austria. It's 62% of the land is covered by the Austrian Alps. And uh, yeah, and I would uh, I would love to have the opportunities to go hiking and exploring the, the mountains. Just yeah, enjoy that, that is hundred percent true. This is uh, almost everywhere in Austria. This is one of the habits to to hike during the summertime and having a ski during the winter time. So this is actually yeah. something. That, anyway, you can enjoy it on both sides. So moving to Europe, it can be a, a difficult, um, uh, a difficult transition for you because of the weather. Because the weather in Europe is colder than um, than where you are right now. Uh, have you considered that or what do you think about this or do you see that as an opportunity? This might be an unpopular opinion, but I actually prefer uh, cold better, uh, than, better than okay. uh, the warm weather. I actually okay. prefer winter. I prefer the rain. I prefer snow. It might be unpopular. It might be just because this is just for me personally speaking, but yeah. <laughs> I okay. actually prefer the cold. Exactly. Let's talk about the language. Um, Karima, I think you are you're speaking at the moment several languages and you are near native in several languages. And right now, by moving to Europe, you're probably going to learn another language or you already started. So um, how is this uh, experience of getting into a new language? I mean, can you tell what is your experience in the current languages and what is the current experience in moving into more languages? Yeah, so uh, I speak uh, Arabic, French and English and the language that I am learning currently is uh, German and it's been fun. You know, there's there's also that there's an element of fun with learning a new language. It always gets interesting uh, and it's also um, a brain exercise in a way. And uh, yeah, so I I kind of view it or approach it as that. So that makes the process of learning the new language a lot more fun. And also I get to learn a bit more about the culture and how they use the language. Because in German, I noticed that the structure of the sentence is that the verb is at the end. So you really have to listen to everything that person is saying all the way till the end to understand. So you can't really go and interrupt. And that was really interesting. So yeah, approaching it that way makes it a lot more fun to, to learn more about it. That is that is correct. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so this is um, en enjoying the language learning is certainly a part of that. And at the moment you are enjoying that. That's actually very good motivation to learn. And um, let's move to the to the next question. I think one of the questions that I wanted to ask is about the social media. So talking about the social media, uh, you are right now having a very good presence in LinkedIn. Um, maybe you can comment on that. When was the time that you started showing your presence in LinkedIn and really using all of the advantages of the LinkedIn? And what do you think about LinkedIn in general? Um, I started uh, showing my presence in LinkedIn, uh, I think 
around November. It's the beginning of November. Uh, yeah, and it's a powerful tool if you know how to use it. It's um, I think it's it's more on the networking skills. If you know how to approach someone, how to send a connection request, a personalized connection request, how to invite that person into an interview. It's sort of like how you pull the strings when it comes to networking and how you uh, communicate yourself or you communicate your ideas. So that helps a lot into building a lot more connections and keeping obviously you, keeping your profile authentic, genuine and honest. Yeah, so that helps a lot. With can you, can you say whether you found any connections like business connections or interview generated through LinkedIn? Uh, yes, so I would send a uh, connection request asking. I, I always try to be very specific why I'm contacting the person and uh, if there if there is anything in common, I always try to highlight that and yeah, and I try to briefly and kindly invite that person for an interview and I, I always state my reasons and always try to be very clear and concise. And so yeah, if the person is interested, then obviously we, uh, we schedule a, uh, an interview. If not, I mean, it's uh, there is always that uh, there's always luck. It's it's not always guaranteed that the person will respond. So you just send requests and then uh, it, you might get responses, but certainly not from everyone. Anima, you are helping us with uh, uh, with the social media uh, channels, especially in LinkedIn, and you've been talking with uh, lots of people, lots of job seekers, uh, and probably you have seen lots of CVs of the job seekers. So if I'm asking you this question, how, what are the typical mistakes that the people do in LinkedIn and what are the typical mistakes that the people do in CV preparation? I think uh, generally speaking, it would be uh, they try to cram everything and I see that sometimes they try to because they want to do it in one page so it just looks very crowded and not so pleasing to the eye and uh, the other thing is that I noticed that they're very much focused on actually getting the job and so they keep promoting their CVs or themselves but not quite promoting the value that they would bring so there needs that's why academics is uh, it's very helpful because we work, we create projects, we work on projects. So that means we have more value to bring. So we have more experience. We, so that's what helps. But then when you are too focused mm -hmm. on promoting a CV that doesn't actually provide or that that CV doesn't show quite the, the qualifications or the kind of projects that would be suitable or that would help your candidacy, I think that's, that might give you a feeling of I feel stuck. But creating that value and showing to that uh, to the hiring manager that this is the value that I'm bringing to the company. So speaking in terms of the value they're going to bring, that's actually what's going to help. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this value relates to the skills related to the project, about the details and documentations that you have in your CV. So yeah. all of this stuff should go all along together. So this is something that is missing. Um, Karima, let's talk about this, uh, the Academics Career Autopilot program. The Academics Career Autopilot program is a program that at the moment doesn't have any similar programs. OK, at least, at least let's assume that, that there is no, not that many similar at uh, that one. So talking about the Academics Career Autopilot program, how would you describe it and how would you compare it with the existing university programs and so? Uh, well, uh, like we mentioned in the beginning, it is uh, focused on the agile approach, the agile career development. Mm -hmm. And so which means that it's personalized and it's catered to the individual's needs and requirements. Uh, and also in terms of the, the projects, we always work on projects that are industry related or that related to the kind of jobs that we want to apply for, which means uh, this this again highlights the the values that we want to add 
to the to the companies that we want to apply for in the future you know the kind of jobs that we want to work in in the future and uh, yeah and also when it comes to the coaching sessions that uh, that you, we get to have with you you're very uh, clear with your directions uh, very kind uh, and patient um, yeah, and, and that's really helpful. And there is the other, the other thing when it comes to reinforcements, positive reinforcements and encouraging us, that goes uh, a long way, especially for us uh, students and candidates um, going through this uh, process or this learning journey. Uh, the other thing that I noticed, especially from the, from the beginning, that is uh, you believe that we can, we can uh, make this work, that we can work on certain projects or on certain tasks. I noticed that from the beginning when you when you were giving me uh, certain tasks and activities to uh, create to build something and you just said I'm pretty sure that you can you can now uh, do this that you can make this happen and at first so uh, maybe this is because I was not assessing myself properly maybe it's because I was selling myself short uh, but then I was I was wondering how is it that you believe in me that I can do these tasks and activities and I don't believe in myself that I can do these tasks and activities. And I noticed that kind of like shifted how I view things uh, and because I want to succeed this, I, I don't want to disappoint, you know, so I, I was like, you know what, I'm going to take the task and I'm going to learn and I'm going to make I'm going to make it happen. And so it's uh, it's not about faking it, uh, fake it until you make it. It's about believe it until you make it. That's what makes the big difference and that what helps a lot. And so I would believe that I would learn this and I would make this happen and I will um, and I would succeed in this project or in these activities. And at the end of the day, it, it always turns out well. And obviously with your guidance. So yeah, it helps. Thank you. And, uh, of course, there is there is one important point that sometimes the people they uh, they don't believe in themselves, but it comes to the topic of the metacognition. Metacognition comes to the category of the topics that you know, but you don't know that you know it. So this is actually awareness about the topics that you potentially know it. So basically a mentor, this is a task of a mentor to realize whether you are potentially capable of doing the topics. So after a specific discussion, for example, when a mentor understands that uh, you are capable of doing that, then the task of a mentor will change to uh, to motivate you, to giving you inspirations or whatever kind of motivation required to bring you to a state that basically make you believe in yourself. This is actually the procedure. But of course, the target should, should be realistic. So if the mentor is trying to push you into the dire direction that is not realistic, then probably you will not going to believe in yourself anyway. So the target should be realistic and it should be based on the, the discussion, but then it should be also challenging enough for you. Now, let me ask you one question. Did you have any feeling that sometimes I'm pushing you too much into the areas that is too challenging for you, or maybe this was challenging enough or it was not challenging? So what do you think about that in terms of challenging topics? Um, well, again, personally speaking, every time you challenge me, I thank you. At first, it might seem so overwhelming for me. I'm like, uh, okay, there's too much going on uh, in my plates. I have so many things. Uh, I don't want to bite more than I can chew. But at the end of the day, I feel like the more challenging the activities that you give me, uh, the more I surprise myself because that pushes me to work even harder to, because like I said, I want to make this uh, work. And so when I, when I finally finish the project on, uh, or when I get it done and I see that my uh, my knowledge has, has grown, I feel like I, I noticed that my skills has improved. And so I actually thank you for pushing me and for challenging me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this, this is actually a mutual understanding that we need to have in order to design those kind of mini challenges. But again, talking about the mini challenges and the smooth development, coming back again to the understanding of the agile approach. So giving the challenges is is difficult on both sides. I think the uh, the mentors or mentees, the both of them, they need to have a good understanding in order to define the challenges 
uh, that is challenging enough, but at the same time, it should not be kind of going to the direction to disappoint the people. And that's actually one of the difficulties. So it's also a challenge for mentors to find a good challenge for the mentees. So that's actually a kind of uh, another challenge. So this is um, this is kind of, let's say, interesting on both sides. But uh, once the people coming into the good understanding, the communication is the key. So that once you don't reach the, the goals, the best thing is to understand, that, okay, you cannot read it, you can talk about the problems and all of this stuff. So this communication. So let's talk about the communication. Uh, um, we are having, uh, I don't know, in total, how many, how many discussions did, did, did we have in total? How many meetings did we have? I don't know, maybe you can give a little bit of uh, intro on that, uh, about the, the discussion, the frequency of the discussions that we had and uh, the type of the discussions that we had, whether this was more technical, non-technical, and so on. So if I'm asking you these questions in general, maybe you can answer it with, with full details. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, communications that we had over the past months. So what is your impression about this communications that we have internally within the program, within the Academics Career Autopilot program? It would be uh, once a week to uh, once uh, every two weeks. So that would be uh, the frequency. Uh, but then again, it depends on the candidate and how much meeting, meetings do they need. Uh, yeah, and every time it would be to keep track of the work. And if I need any assistance or if I need any more guidance or directions, then I would book a meeting to talk more about that. and. Uh, and you give uh, or you explain in a way without overwhelming me with details. So that helps a lot. And yeah, and so and also to uh, to like I said, to keep track of the work of the activities to revise everything. And so uh, and if there is anything that needs to be uh, um, adjusted, then again, in, in an agile way, we mm -hmm. would work on it again. And so, yeah and the cycle keeps going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Karimar, let's go to the next question. One of the most important uh, skills that you have at the moment is to manage a complete marketing campaign and not only to implement a specific marketing campaign, is, and, but also to strategically think about designing and redesigning an existing campaign. I'm really happy that you are a part of the team and you're helping us with the development of the marketing. But let me ask you this question. Generally, how do you manage to cater a marketing campaign? How do you use the ideas to design a new marketing campaign? Maybe you can answer that based on your, your experience that you have. Yeah, so first of all is that I need to understand the audience. I need to understand their pain points and what they're looking for. And so the message is always catered to the audience. Uh, and uh, also, um, if it's in the form of storytelling, that also helps a lot because that's what attracts uh, our attention the most is uh, stories. And uh, if we can, uh, and again, if we can cater that content to be uh, either inspirational or educational, motivational, or, uh, and also, uh, promotional to the company and so taking all of that into consideration it's it always comes down to understanding and listening to the audience what they're looking for what do they need and then we ca I cater the content and I cater the message to target that and uh, doing all of that whilst being honest and authentic and of course uh, genuine and keeping um, the, the customer first. So again, it comes down to the customer centricity. So that's how I approach the, the content in general. Talking about the social media, can you explain a little bit more into details, specifically when we are talking about the storytelling part of the marketing campaign? How would you make a balance between all of this stuff? Because um, if you want to bring a story as a marketing campaign into social media, how would you design it? 
Well, uh, you know that people are, are looking for, uh, they, they don't just look for uh, the features of the product. They're looking for benefits. They're, they're looking for a story. They want to be part of a cause. And so that's what I keep in mind when I try to create something and how I want to promote it. And I always do that 80-20 rule, which is 80% is all about uh, educating the audience, uh, providing inspirational content, and basically listening to their questions and answering the questions. And then 20% would be to promote the product and uh, yeah, to deliver the, the features and the benefits of the product. So I try to keep that balance every time I, I continue with a marketing campaign. So yeah, and uh, I always try to keep in mind the trends. I, so yeah, if there is anything new that's going on, the best approach would be to get on board and to, and to keep up with every ongoing change. Uh, yeah, so that's generally how I go about it. Very good, very good. Um, another aspect of the marketing is to have the authority to publish the topics. Okay, sometimes the people they are working in a marketing department, but they don't have the permission to publish something based on them. So, how do you feel when you're working in academics and project? Um, because we want to bring the people very close to the to the real case situations that are used in industry. So do you think that this additional permission that you have to immediately implement it, is this an, a kind of added value or would you rather prefer to get the permission every time and all of this stuff? So do you think that this is a kind of added value? Yes, for sure, because it encourages the creative abilities our uh, creative abilities instead of just shutting and sh shutting us down and there isn't that micromanagement so it's uh, which is quite overwhelming and it's very limiting so we get that freedom where we can create where we can express our ideas where we can uh, contribute and at the same time we're getting feedback so that helps a lot 